Welcome back to CBS News. I'm Lana Zak. We continue to follow this breaking news for you from New York City. The largest judgment to date has been issued against former President Donald Trump. Judge Ngoron has imposed a penalty of more than $350 million against Donald Trump, as well as his adult sons and his corporation in that civil fraud case brought by New York Attorney General Letitia James. The former president is being ordered to pay more than $354 million in damages. His co-defendants are being ordered to pay another $10 million in fines. The judge has also banned the former president from conducting business in the state of New York over the next three years. Eric Trump and Donald Trump Jr. are prevented from serving as an officer or director of any New York corporation for the next two years. We have team coverage of this ruling now. Scott McFarlane and Major Garrett are in Washington. Katrina Kaufman is here with me in New York. So I'm going to start first of all with CBS News campaign reporter and attorney Katrina Kaufman here with me. So Katrina, it's interesting. Most of this is against former President Trump, the Trump Corporation. But then there are also specific times where Judge Ngoron calls out Eric Trump and Donald Trump Jr. Talk to us about the judgments against Donald Trump's children. Yeah, so along with Trump, this really implicates his sons as well. They are not able to do business in New York for two years, and it really puts in question who is going to lead the Trump Corporation. It can't be a Trump family member. Um, and another part that I thought was interesting was about Ivanka, who is not a defendant in this case. She was originally, but it was dismissed against her. But when she took the stand, she said, that she didn't recall more times than I could possibly count. And the judge notes her testimony and says that while he found her thoughtful, articulate, and a poised witness, uh, he found that very suspect. And he really just questions credibility of witnesses throughout this opinion. There was another witness, Eli Bartov, who Trump thought was really a star witness for his case. He's an accounting professor from NYU. And basically, Ngoron ultimately said later that if you pay someone a million dollars, they'll say anything on your behalf. And in this opinion, he again says that he just really didn't find that testimony credible. All right. I'm going to bring in now CBS News Chief Washington Correspondent Major Garrett. He is in Washington. Uh, Major, I want to get your take on mm -hmm. some of what we're hearing. There is very strong language coming from sure. Judge Ngoron and all of this. In fact, saying that, uh, that the defendant's facts and expert witnesses denied reality, saying mm -hmm. uh, about the defendants that their complete lack of contrition and remorse borders on pathological. <laughs> and at one point, he says that the defendant's refusal to admit error, indeed, to continue it, according to the Independent Monitor, constrains this court to conclude that they will engage in it going forward unless judicially restrained. Uh, having had just a little bit of time to start to look into uh, this judgment, what jumps out to you? So Judge N. Goron knew that this would be appealed, and he knew that the argument that this was a selective application of New York law based on valuations and alleged fraud would stand out, and that he better have an explanation as to why this case was handled the way it was. And his explanation, Lana, is exactly as you just articulated. The judge says, in the pattern of conversation and testimony and actual evidence, the Trump organization, led by the former president, refused to acknowledge errors did not say that it would have to take any remedial action to correct the obvious errors in their business practices, fraudulent as asserted by the New York Attorney General, and if not penalized, would inevitably continue to engage in manifest fraud in New York. So much so that not only is the former president required to pay this disgorgement, that's the technical term, mm -hmm. but others in the Trump organization found to be liable for this sort of culture of fraudulency are barred from participation, two of them in particular, right. for the remainder of their business careers, Alan Weisselberg and Jeffrey McConney. So what is evident in this explanation from the judge is not only the fact pattern, not only the law, but when this gets to an appeals court to say, I had to take these steps because if I didn't, not only would the public in New York be harmed, but the very business climate former President Trump says is endangered by this judgment, would be threatened even more. 
Major, I want to follow up with you just on one point that you were making right now, which is that Weisselberg and McConney uh, have been banned not for a period of three years, as is the case for, our, for the former president, or two years, as is the case for his his adult sons, but for the rest of their lives, uh, mm -hmm. really, in conducting any business here in New York. So, um, what? Why do you think there is a difference in a harsher penalty uh, for those two officers of the Trump Corporation as opposed to the people? who actually have Trump in their name. Because they were the ones closest to and with direct supervisorial roles in all of these representations. And it is an acknowledgement that the Trump organization, through not only the former president but his two sons, is in part a branding organization. And the brand does matter and they are representative of that brand but are not in every instance necessarily responsible or if not responsible directly involved in all these numerical valuations the other two gentlemen quite obviously are and it was their career path within the trump organization to do that work they were most directly involved in it and from the judge's perspective therefore most liable for it and to receive therefore the harshest sanction all right, Major, thank you for your insights. I'm going to bring in now CBS News congressional correspondent Scott McFarland, also there in Washington. Scott, we're already seeing fundraising coming off of the Trump campaign. Uh, Trump Make America Great Again 2024 writes, and the witch hunt breaking from Trump. Democratic New York judge just ruled against me. Talk to us about the response from the former president, his legal team, and how this is likely going to play out on the campaign trail. Well, the most likely response is actually going to be the appeal that is imminent in this case and has been forecast for weeks, if not months. But the political positioning of Donald Trump has been consistent throughout this case, arguing invariably that this is a witch hunt, that it's a miscarriage of justice. And in fact, the statement issued by Trump.org right after this judgment was that it's a miscarriage of justice that is going to cause an exodus of businesses out of New York State if it's left to stand. This was somewhat predictable. There was a silver lining in here for Donald Trump. There was a partial victory. There was not an order that he dissolve his business. What the judge has ordered here is an independent monitor, an independent director of compliance to be paid for by Trump.org, which will allow the business to remain a thing. Now, this business has obviously made Trump an awful lot of money, but I think it's also something in which he's taken great pride and tried to build his brand before his political career. The business stays in place. But something else just keeps jumping out of me from this judgment. It's what the judge says about Trump's children mm. and the language the judge uses in the order. First of all, about Trump's two sons, Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Trump. The judge finds that they intentionally falsified business records and that they are to be barred from being an officer of a corporation in New York for three years. But I'm actually more struck by the, the phrases he uses in describing Ivanka Trump, who famously testified at this trial. The judge emphasizes that Ivanka Trump had no recollection of any of the events that gave rise to this action when she was being questioned during the trial. But she suddenly had quite a bit of memory when she was being questioned by her own attorneys in response. And what the judge here says is that her lack of memory aside, he'll let the emails and the records determine the outcome here. And he found that the emails and the records through Ivanka Trump were part of the reason, part of the justification for this ruling. But the judge also made a point of saying in his judgment that Ivanka Trump was a thoughtful, articulate, and poised witness, but the court found her inconsistent recall a suspect. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's noteworthy that not only does this judgment have implications on Trump's two sons, but the judge spent a lot of bandwidth in this order talking about his impressions of the children and what role they played in all this. And Lon, if I could jump in real quick, Please, also yes. uh, quoting from the judge's opinion, because that is really what's going to be before the appellate jurisdiction on this. I want to read from it directly. They are accused, meaning the Trump organization, former President Trump, his children and the others, only of inflating asset values to make more money. The documents prove this over and over again. I continue to quote, this is a venal sin, not a mortal sin. Mm -hmm. Defendants did not commit murder or arson. They did not rob a bank at gunpoint. Donald Trump is not Bernard Madoff. Yet defendants are incapable, the judge says, of admitting the error of their ways. Instead, the judge writes, they adopt a see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil posture that the evidence belies. The court is not constituted to judge morality. 
It is constituted to find facts and apply the law. In this particular case, applying the law to the facts, the court intends to protect the integrity of the financial marketplace and thus the public as a whole. This goes to the larger construct of the appeal. This judge is saying, I'm not going out of bounds here. I am doing this for a very specific reason, informed by not only the evidence, but the defendant's attitude to that evidence and the fact pattern that they must take account for. I had highlighted that same section, Major. Uh, <laughs> Katrina, I want to get your take on this appeal question. Uh, one of the, the arguments that was raised was that this is common business practice mm -hmm. and that the Trump Organization wasn't doing anything other than any other big corporation in New York does. The judge, I want to quote from the document, wrote, indeed, the common excuse that everybody does it is all the more reason to strive for honesty and transparency and to be vigilant in enforcing the rules how much of that is going to be part of the defense as this is appealed by Trump? They absolutely might incorporate that into their defense. And I do think that this is potentially a common New York real estate business practice. But yeah, in the very same passage you were reading, he says, New York means business in combating business fraud. Um, and I think that another part of it, though, is what we were talking about earlier, which is the lack of contrition as well um, in, in the Bernie Madoff comparison, actually, which at the very end of the trial, I think one of the last things Judge Angoran asked was for them to compare Trump to Bernie Madoff. And Madoff actually said that he was sorry for what he did. In this opinion, the judge notes that even, you know, to this day, Trump says that he did nothing wrong here. In fact, the only mistake he ever admitted was the size of his triplex, which I think he accidentally admitted when he made that grand closing statement during closing arguments. He said that they accidentally inflated that, right. and that was a mistake. But other than that, he says that his financial statements are perfect, that there were disclaimers, the banks weren't supposed to rely on them. And so I think that that really factors into this judgment as well. Let's get into some, the, the extent of those errors or that inflation. Uh, Major, if you could talk to our viewers a little bit about, in particular, Mar-a-Lago and how much the Trump Organization had valued that property at, because I think you have some very interesting insights into that. Yes, I'll flip to it, but it's page 36. I'll try to recall it from memory. Essentially, the Trump Organization and the former president, who takes justifiable pride in Mar-a-Lago, I've covered many events there, it is a very nice place, said the valuation of that should properly be estimated between a billion and one and a half billion dollars, far in excess of any kind of valuation ever ascribed to Mar-a-Lago. And, as the document in the court judgment says, to, for that to be true, it would have to be 400 times more valuable than the most valuable property anywhere in the United States. And that, and I'm inserting these words, not from the judgment itself, strains credulity and doesn't add up in, in essence. And that is one of the things that the judge found was a persistent pattern and one of a pattern that was sort of incorporated into the business culture of the Trump Organization, this judgment finds. You know, he has been called before the Teflon Don uh, because so many of the conventional wisdom uh, items don't seem to apply. Um, it, uh, just even looking back at, you know, the, the Trump Organization being convicted of tax fraud in 2022 and being fined $1.6 million, that would have killed another presidential campaign that would have severely hurt another organization. Um, does this judgment hurt Donald Trump? It might. There is always the possibility within the aura around Donald Trump that something will begin the process of re-examination. I am schooled by the history that I've experienced since the summer of 2015 when I began on a daily basis to cover then-candidate Trump, eventually nominee Trump, President Trump, and now former Trump, former President Trump, that there is a resilience around not only his marketed and built name brand and political brand, but there is a resilience around the sense that his supporters have that the reason that he is in these legal barrels is not because he did something wrong, but because some forces are trying to knock him down. And by trying to knock him down, they are trying to knock down the aspirations of his supporters. And as long as that sense of connectedness continues, judgments like this, however harshly worded, will probably have 
scarce political impact. Scott McFarland, your take. Does this hurt him? Well, I mean, look at the bottom line of this judgment, notwithstanding the money. Judges ruled Donald Trump is not fit to be an officer of a corporation in the state of New York for three years. That based on his conduct, the fraud that the judge found, that he's not able to do that or rightful to do that. But he is able and rightful to be the leading contender for the Republican nomination for the White House. Can't run a New York business, but might be positioned to run the country. That contrast just jumps out at me. And no matter what the appeal is here, even if the money gets knocked down or the money gets erased, you can't erase that judgment from a judge in New York State. And I, I can't get past that because I think fundamentally that's the big non-financial takeaway of this ruling. The appeals will happen and Trump has found himself to be particularly effective, not just willing, but effective at delaying things in court, stalling things out, slowing things down. And potentially he could extend the time frame on this quite a bit. But you can't change the sentiment of the judge, which is that even though this case is financial in nature, it's a pretty damning indictment in the 92-page judgment. All right, Katrina Kaufman, that question about the delay, about the appeal, how long, what is the timeline now for an appeal on this case? Of when he has to appeal by? You know, I'm not positive what the timeline is for that, but one thing I was thinking about is that I was sitting in the New York Hush Money trial yesterday when they were setting the trial date, and his lawyer was talking about the burden that trying to prepare and then be a part of that case is going to put on him while he's campaigning, and so now... He's embroiled in an appeal. He's going to be appealing the E. Jean Carroll verdict. Mm -hmm. He's going to be appealing this verdict. He has a criminal trial starting and all of that while he's campaigning. So whether or not this hurts him in the polls, I mean, he's engaged in all of these cases, not to mention the other criminal cases that he's also uh, being prosecuted in that are going to be moving forward as well. So this is all just a big burden on Donald Trump. And speaking of those other criminal cases, we're going to dig into that on the other side of this break. I want to thank Major Garrett, Katrina Kaufman, and Scott McFarland.